want to take a minute to talk about bias. The first type of bias is selection bias. Selection bias is when there is the non-random assignment to a particular study group. So essentially you're not picking people at random. That is going to lead to a selection bias. And the way to fix that is essentially just to pick people at random when you're making your study. Now the second type of bias is recall bias. And recall bias occurs when you're picking, when people are in a study and they're asked uh, about certain factors or things in the past. A lot of times, let's say you pick individuals for the study who have disease X and they're asked what, what they did, any kind of behavior, any kind of uh, drugs they took, any kind of uh, lifestyle, uh, things that they had back in the past. And the problem is a lot of people, they forget and they may not remember certain drugs they took. They may not remember certain things they did, or they may uh, basically cover up for things they did. So when you're going back in the past, um, a lot of times you can have recall bias. And one way to fix that recall bias, um, one way to solve problems with the recall bias when you are asking people about the, fat, the past, is to find some way to independently verify those uh, facts that they bring up. Another type of bias, um, and this is somewhat high yield, is sampling bias. The problem with sampling bias is you're not picking a sample that's reflective of the general population. And a lot of times this occurs when people volunteer for particular studies. When people are volunteering for studies, they may, they may have a, a reason. They may have uh, some sort of financial um, uh, stake you know, they may not be individuals that are, for whatever reason, may be uh, representative of the general population. Another problem with uh, sampling bias is when you're asking for people who may have been exposed to a particular chemical. You know, you may get individuals who are very sick. Those are the people who may be uh, come forward. Um, so those people may not be representative of the general population. Um, and really, just as far as sampling bias, one way to combat that is uh, just like selection bias, you know, make sure that you pick a random sample of individuals for your study. As far as late look bias, uh, that occurs when people are looking at a lot of times fatal diseases or diseases where a lot of individuals have already died. So assume you're not getting a, a random sample of the general population, especially when you're looking at a lot of diseases you know, that have a, a high fatality rate. So not including those individuals to have already died is going to give you uh, skewed results. So you need to just be cognizant of that uh, when you're um, looking at any kind of uh, studies that have a uh, high uh, fatality rates. Number five is procedure bias. And this occurs when subject and a, subjects in a particular group are not treated the same. For example, when you have subjects in a treatment group that are given more attention that can result in procedure bias. The sixth type of bias is confounding bias. And confounding bias occurs when you have two closely related factors and that un unstudied factor is going to affect your results. For example, smoking and drinking are related. So if you have a study looking at the effects of alcohol on lung cancer, there may be some that may show a causation, when in reality it's the smoking that is really the cause of the lung cancer. So we really need to be on the lookout for confounding bias when you have an unrelated fact or a closely related factor that was not studied is the actual cause of the uh, of the problem of the uh, connection. Uh, lead time bias is another uh, high yield uh, subject. Lead time bias is occurring with greater and greater frequency because of the advancements in technology. Years ago, the screening tests for many types of cancer uh, were not very accurate. It wasn't, you couldn't detect a certain type of cancer until it reached a certain size, and now you can detect cancer when it's getting smaller and smaller. So, or you have greater procedures where you can detect cancer. So a lot of times with cancer, 
you're going to see issues with lead time bias. For example, you have a screening test 10 years ago that would detect that once you detected cancer, individuals would die within five years. But now you have a screening test where people have a seven year survival rate. The screening test isn't the cause of the uh, longer survival. The screening test essentially is just catching the disease earlier. So a lot of times uh, with cancer, you need to be on the lookout for lead time bias. Pygmalion effect and the Hawthorne effect are pretty similar. The Pygmalion effect is when the researcher it wants a certain result to occur. I like to think about you've got uh, situations where in DNA tests for criminals, the researcher is told that this person is the suspect and when they're making their analysis, if it's close, they say it's a match. Now, if they didn't know the person was a, su was a suspect, they would never even give a match in the first place. That's what the Pygmalion effect is. And we need, when researchers know the intended result or are trying to get a particular result that they want, um, that's the uh, Pygmalion effect. Now, the Hawthorne effect a lot, occur, a lot of times occurs with the subjects. Now, subjects of the study a lot of times change their behavior because they know they're being watched. Uh, for exercise studies, people exercise more. Um, for certain other types of studies, they may you know, change their lifestyle in a more positive way because they know that they're being part of the study. Uh, for doctors, let's say there's a study on vaccinations, a doctor may want to uh, do, have more vaccinations than normal because he doesn't want to look bad, uh, people don't want to look bad, and all that really comes down to is the uh, Hawthorne effect.